back to the Witsy Go 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 Show. Guess who has 10 toes and just got a new camera? Liz Gale. Mm -hmm. You see, Hala and I were outside meditating in the woods late one night when I heard a rustling on the bushes. Lo and behold, a being of pure light appeared before us and presented upon its outstretched hand a device of remarkable technology. Ow. I know you, our dearest viewers, will deeply miss that sweet, sweet potato technology, but I couldn't help it. It was, it was such a remarkable gift. I just couldn't turn it down. So in honor of my new equipment, I thought I'd do something kind of photography related and Photography it was. Yep, that's actually a thing. I actually found it while researching the Tulpa video, so it's somewhat related. There are many other names for photography, including projected thermography, psychic photography, ningraphy, and ninsha, which translates to since inception. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's trying to project your thoughts onto photographic media of some sort. Oh, we have a special guest. No, we don't. Photography got its start back in the late 1800s. The first mention of it was in a book entitled The New Photography by Arthur Brunel Chatwood. <laughs> Stop painting. <laughs> Which was published in 1896. The book was heavily criticized, but nevertheless the idea did catch on. Like a lot of things I'm going to be talking about on this channel and have already discussed, it was influenced by spiritism, and specifically spirit, spiritualism, not spiritism, and specifically spirit photography. Even Nikola Tesla believed in the possibility of photography. He wrote, I became convinced that a definite image formed in thought must, by reflex action, produce a corresponding image on the retina, which might be read by a suitable apparatus. This brought me to my system of television, which I announced at the time. My idea was to employ an artificial retina, receiving an object of the image seen. An optic nerve and another retina at the place of reproduction, both being fashioned somewhat like a checkerboard, with the optic nerve being a part of the earth. However, rather obviously, nothing ever came of that. I guess it's kind of a prerequisite of great inventors that they have to have at least one bizarre fringe invention to work on, kind of like Edison and his spirit film. The first major study into thought photography took place in 1910 in Japan, where Tomokichi Fukurai, assistant professor of psychology at Tokyo University, began experiments with parapsychology, which included thought photography. Fukurai was convinced that one of his subjects, Ikuko Nagao was capable of projecting her thoughts on the photoplates. It's Fukurai who coined the term Nensha for this alleged phenomenon, which was popularized actually in the horror movie The Ring. However, both Fukurai and Nagao were heavily criticized, and there is some controversy that this might have led to the fever that caused Nagao's death. Moreover, <laughs> Nagao was not the only one of Fukurai's subjects to die. <laughs> Alleged clairvoyant Chizuko Mifune committed suicide after some rather dubious experiments of Fukurai's led to her also being called a fraud. Fukurai continued his research with another clairvoyant by the name of Sadako Takahashi, who was also said to be capable of photography, and proceeded to write a book in 1913 titled Clairvoyance and Photography. However, there were many irregularities in his studies, and the whole situation was said to be characterized by a lack of scientific approach. Fukurai ended up resigning his position at the university a few years later. In 1960, Fukurai's son-in-law founded the Fukurai Institute of Psychology Incorporated. You know that incorporated just adds so much more uh, legitimacy to the name which aims to further Fukurai's parapsychological studies. As far as I can tell, they do still exist, but I can't find out what, if anything, they're actually currently doing. If you know anything about them, please feel free to leave a comment. I'm sure other people are just as curious as I am. Later research in the 1920s is detailed by Harroward Carrington in his book Problems with Psychical Research where he explained that the photography process actually does not involve any cameras. 
Instead, the subject is actually using photographic plates, which were more common back then before film really became popular. These plates would be carefully wrapped in either black paper or placed inside a black envelope, which was then sealed to be both light, tight, and tamper evident. The plates were then held for a period of time while the individual attempted to project an image onto them. The image would be agreed upon by the entire party of the experiment ahead of time so as not to be able to say, oh look, I did that, yeah, I totally meant that, after the fact. After a period of time of the individual trying to do their thing, this plate is then taken into the dark room, unwrapped, and processed as normal. Carrington maintained in his book that there were in fact experiments carried out where the plate very clearly showed the exact image that had been agreed upon ahead of time. He also noted that the shapes seen on the plates would often be influenced by the subject's frame of mind, uh, their emotions at the time, with uh, calm emotions producing more gentle snowflake-like patterns and violent emotions producing patterns that seemed more to resemble storms. And this harkens back to the early Theosophist idea of thought forms. Not necessarily Tolpa's, but rather Bassant's early idea of thought forms being abstract shapes that could be seen around an individual. The difference, of course, being that thought forms could supposedly be actually seen with the naked eye. However, these forms tended to vary depending on the emotions the individual was having at the time with more violent emotions creating more violent looking shapes. Carrington felt that these vi that these vibrations <laughs> Carrington felt that these effects were caused by vibrations on what he called the ether surrounding us and uh, that these vibrations were the result of our thoughts. And in one of the reasoning points mentioned in the book he put forward an experiment done in 1873 by a Dr. Gladstone, where Gladstone traced drawings on cardboard in an invisible ink that was made of mineral uranite and disulfate of quinine, in other words radioactive ink, I'm sure that was very healthy for them. When photographed, the drawings came out bold and clear. The point being that it's possible there's some unknown substance that can't be seen by the naked eye but that can be picked up by the photographic process or perhaps by certain individuals in the case of thought forms who are sensitive to seeing it and this subject may yet be undiscovered by science but may in fact be discovered someday. To his credit, Carrington and those he quoted in the book actually seemed very diligent about investigating, learning about, and eliminating hoaxes and happenstance and he only cites as paranormal those cases in which he truly felt that a hoax or mundane explanation was completely ruled out. These studies were often carried out with surprisingly good standards for the time, not entirely dissimilar to what we do today. Going in expecting fraud, using only material that the investigator had procured and that was never left alone with the subject, and everyone in the experiment at any given time had two witnesses watching them. That said, it was the 1920s, they did have different standards back then, and moreover, as I have mentioned before, spiritualism was very popular, and in fact, the majority of the people quoted in the book were self-professed mystics, psychics, spiritualists, and students of the occult who took telepathy as fact. So, needless to say, they had a little bit of a bias. Probably one of the most well-known cases of thoughtography occurred in the 1960s when a psychiatrist by the name of Jewel Eisenbud discovered unemployed bellhop Ted Sirius. Eisenbud began a long series of experiments with Sirius in an attempt to prove that he was capable of psychically projecting his thoughts onto specifically Polaroid film. Sirius used a small tube of rolled up black paper, which he called his gizmo, which he would place against his forehead and the other end against the lens of the camera, and then he would instruct whoever was holding the camera to release the shutter at a given time. He would let members of the audience examine the gizmo, and it was said that nothing was ever found inside the paper. He claimed he just used it to help him focus. Sirius was a character. 
uh, many individuals would be invited to witness these experiments that were conducted. They would often last for up to eight hours, during which time Sirios would be plied with alcohol. Now Sirios was already an alcoholic. <laughs> So what Dr. Eisenbud would do is when Sirios was cooperating and producing results, he would be given alcohol, which Sirios claimed improved his thoughtography. If Sirios was being uncontrollable and violent, which often happened, the alcohol would be withheld. So as you can imagine, Dr. Eisenbud had many claims against him that he was in fact conditioning Sirios. Sirius's behavior was infamous. He would rant and rave and sometimes strip naked and throw tantrums, and it was said that he often exhibited bipolar and sociopathic tendencies, which I'm sure the alcohol did wonders for. However, many people felt that at some point in his life he had actually practiced as a magician and that his behavior was an effective distraction for sleight of hand tricks. Serials reportedly hated photographers and did not allow them to attend his experiments. However, one photographer by the name of Niall Root, which is an awesome name, managed to work his way into a few experiments due to his connection with some doctors that Dr. Eisenbud hoped to impress. Niall at one point caught a glimpse of something inside the gizmo and proceeded to go home and fashion himself a tiny tube with lenses on one end and a teeny tiny little bit of either transparency or slide film on the other. Using this device, he was essentially able to create the same type of images as Sirios, albeit without the sleight of hand. In fact, he actually performed this method in front of Eisenbud and a group of other doctors. However, it turned out that all but one of them actually very much believed in Sirius's ability and so didn't give Root any credence. However, many, many other people came forward exposing Sirius as a fraud, including even famed skeptic and magician James Randi on television, no less. But even so, Eisenbud not only wrote a book about Sirios, entitled The World of Ted Sirios, Studies of an Extraordinary Mind, but a story even made it on TV in an episode in December 1967 of a series called Horizon, an episode of Arthur C. Clarke's Strange World, and an episode of In Search Of. Chris Carter of The X-Files even at one point signed a movie deal with Eisenbud about the book, and in the 90s, there was an art gallery in New York that sold some of the alleged photographs for exorbitant sums. As far as I can tell, throughout this entire time, Eisenbud never once doubted Sirius's ability, even going so far as to believe that Sirius had produced photographs of the surface of Ganymede. As recently as 1995, Yuri Geller proceeded to leave a lens cap on a 35mm camera and take a picture of his forehead. The resulting images were said to be influenced directly by his mind. Of course, the rebuttal is that he likely either used pre-exposed film or used a trick similar to Sirios with a little device. Unsurprisingly, photography has been an episode of The X-Files, in an episode entitled Unruh, other than that, though, it's not entirely popular today, but there are still people performing experiments. In particular, if you go to thoughtography.net, you can find a few recent photographs by Into the Light Productions. However, other than that, it doesn't seem like there are really any new developments into the field. So, did I miss something? Have you been practicing thoughtography? Do you have some amazing photographs you want to share the world? If so, let me know in the comments below. Also, I want to start doing subscriber story time episodes, so if you have had a bizarre, unexplained, m m mysterious mystery happen to you, again, either leave it in the comments below or you can reach out to me by direct message on any of my social media, which should be proudly displayed right here on the screen if I do this correctly in editing. Like if you're excited for the better video quality and the new setup. 
I didn't even mention that at the start of the video. I was just so excited about the camera. We have a new set. What do you think? Give it a like. And if you would like to see more of the unexplained, the mysterious, and the mysterious, be sure to give, I think I already said this, be sure to give us a subscribe and we will be producing more that will be magically shot through the air into your computer. This has been the Wendigo A Go-Go Show. Sign it. I know you are dear.